I had never imagined that I would be a single father, but unfortunately, I had no other choice. My wife and I met in high school and we fell in love at first sight. We began to date and after we graduated college we got married and began trying to have children as we both wanted to start a family more than anything in the whole world. We would talk for hours about how many children we wanted, but then we found out that I had a condition. While I wasn't infertile, it would take medical intervention for us to be able to conceive a child. Thankfully, we were both working good jobs and were able to afford the treatment we needed. And not long after, our son was born. It was hard to know that we would have only one child, but we were happy and cherished the blessing that our son was to us. Unfortunately though, years later, tragedy struck again when my wife developed cancer. She fought hard, but the disease was just too aggressive, and she passed. I had never imagined losing my wife at such a young age, and for my 13-year-old son to lose his mother was devastating. It took years of therapy for us to heal and to process that amount of pain. The years passed and I found myself beginning to feel lonely. And while the pain of losing my wife was still there, it had lessened greatly. Even my son noticed and while it was difficult to think about, he encouraged me to start dating. Hey dad, listen, I miss mom a lot too, but she wouldn't want you to go through the rest of your life alone. I know it's hard, but maybe you should put yourself out there. You never know, you might meet someone. I know you're right, Michael. I'll give it some thought. He was right, of course. But getting back into the dating scene was awkward for me. I must have went on dozens of first dates, but they never amounted to a second until I met Megan. She was so patient and understanding, and before I knew it, we had been dating for close to a year. She made me feel so loved that I proposed to her, and she said yes. The ceremony was small, but neither of us cared. We were just so happy to have found each other, and I was happy that I had found Michael a mother that loved him as much as I did. Soon after we were married, Megan moved in with us, and not long afterwards, I began to notice Michael acting strangely. He began to have outbursts in school and was getting into fights. Even his grades began to slip. He went from getting high marks to just barely passing. And when I asked him what was wrong, he yelled at me and told me to leave him alone. I had always known that having a teenage boy would be challenging, but I had never dreamed it would be this difficult. The more I tried to get him to talk to me, the more aggressive and distant he became. I was incredibly worried, although speaking with Megan about it definitely helped. I just don't know what to do. He's never been like this before. It's like he's a completely different person. Well, maybe it's just because he needs time to adjust. For a long time, it was just the two of you, and now he has to get used to having a stepmother. Give him time. I'm sure he'll come around. You're probably right. It's just really hard seeing him go through this. I hadn't considered that the reason he was acting out was because of Megan, but it did make a lot of sense. And so I trusted that given enough time and love that things would sort themselves out. But as the weeks went by, his behavior only worsened. Megan, to her credit, tried to talk with Michael as well. But when she did, it only seemed to make him more agitated. I began to wonder if maybe Megan was right and that Michael was resenting her, thinking that she was replacing his mother and that upset him deeply, as if that wasn't enough to worry about. Megan began to feel sick on a regular basis. Many of the foods that she normally loved were now making her feel nauseous. This made my stomach drop as my head instantly went to the idea that it was cancer. Worried I asked her to go and see the doctor immediately. She did. But when she came home, she was smiling from ear to ear. Oh, honey, it's not bad news at all, but good news. I'm pregnant. I was floored. I had no idea how this could have happened since I was essentially infertile, although I had never told Megan. After all, we were both older, and I assumed that she wasn't interested in having children. I couldn't help but think that my new wife had cheated on me. My world was spinning. I had no idea what to make of all of this, between my son acting erratically and my wife being pregnant. I didn't know if I could handle any more surprises. I chose to not say anything about my infertility to my wife and instead pretended to be happy and excited while on the inside, I made plans to find out the truth. I placed an app on her phone so that I could see who she was calling and texting. 
but after a week of checking her phone and following her whenever she drove somewhere, I didn't see her go anywhere strange or even meet up with anyone. Her only texts were to her parents, my son and myself, although the app didn't allow me to see what the messages said. Two months into her pregnancy though, she came home crying and told Michael and I that she had had a miscarriage and lost the baby. I didn't know how to feel. After all, I was certain that it wasn't my child, but I also had no idea who the father was. I didn't know how to feel. That is until I noticed Michael crying even more than Megan was. It's going to be okay, Michael. This is a tragedy, but Megan is going to be okay. We're not going to lose her. You don't understand. This is so much worse than that. Michael, sobbing heavily, passed me his phone and showed me the text that he and Megan had been sharing. Megan suddenly stopped crying and grew incredibly angry as she saw Michael pass me the phone. Confused, I looked down at it and began to read. There were several inappropriate texts sent from Megan to Michael. There were images of her wearing nothing at all. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. What is this? Why would you send my son these things? He probably took them when I wasn't looking. Your son is a peeping Tom. She's lying, Dad. She's been making me do things that I didn't want to do ever since you started dating her. I'm so sorry, Dad. I truly didn't want to. But she told me that if I said anything, that you would send me away to military school and I would never see you again. My heart was breaking seeing Michael this upset, but now it all made sense. My son had only been acting out because he didn't know how to process what this adult woman was doing to him. He was being abused, and he didn't know how to handle this very difficult situation, and was reacting in the only way he could think of. How could you do this to my son? Was the baby his? Without responding, Megan quickly turned and ran out the door and drove off so quickly that she almost got into a car accident leaving our driveway. I was shocked, but I knew that my son needed me, and I instantly went over to comfort him. I couldn't believe it. On the one hand, I was furious that my new wife would hurt my family in such a terrible way, but I was even more angry at myself for bringing her into our family to begin with. I hated myself for putting my son in such a terrible situation. It took years before both of us felt well enough to say that we had healed from this latest trauma, but after a lot of therapy, I am happy to say that we have never been closer. It wasn't easy, of course. But I'm thrilled to say that despite all that my son has gone through, that he is married with children of his own, and being a grandfather makes me happier than I could ever imagine. I do get lonely from time to time, but I fill my free time with hobbies and spending time with my grandsons and I do feel fulfilled. As for Megan, well, she didn't get very far. After she left, I requested that the baby she miscarried be tested and we found out that my son was indeed the father. With that evidence, I went to the police and charged her with child abuse and sexual assault. Sadly, it did take the police a couple of years to track her down, but once they did, she was charged and is still in prison to this day. It turned out that my son wasn't her first victim, and upon hearing what she had done, the judge that presided over her case had given her the maximum penalty for her crimes. After she had been caught, my son and I sued her for emotional pain and suffering, and were surprised to be awarded over $50,000 each for what she did. Even though she had been on the run after she fled our house, she had been busy working and had made a great deal of money since then. The money, of course, couldn't undo the pain that she had done to us, but it did help to make our lives a little easier. Although I put my share of the money aside and thanks to some good investments, I am happy to say that my grandsons are going to be receiving enough money to buy themselves their first homes when they are old enough. Thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Laura. I met my husband Alex when we were on vacation on a tropical island. We were both staying at the same resort and met purely by accident although years later, my husband swears that it had been fate. We lived in separate countries in the beginning, but it was hard and we wanted to be together. And so I sold my home and moved in with Alex and our love began to blossom. Years after I moved in with him, we got married. 
although his mother disapproved of the wedding. At first I couldn't understand what she had against me, and I tried to comfort her and told her that I would never replace her in a million years, but that wasn't the issue. She didn't care that I made her son happy. The only thing that she could see was that my skin was black. She would make comments about my skin or hair, and I tried to ignore her, but it was more than either of us could bear. And so my husband and I cut contact with her. I could tell that it was hard on my husband, but he promised me that he was okay. Then one day she reached out and promised that she had changed and had seen the error of her ways. I was skeptical, but Alex got so excited that I chose to forgive and forget. And for some time we did get along, although I could tell that she still didn't care for me. But my husband was happy that he had her back in his life. So I ignored the warning signs. Regardless, we went on with our lives and we came to realize that our small apartment wasn't big enough. We knew that one day we would need more room as we had plans to have children. Luckily, I still had money from the sale of my house and we used it as a down payment on our dream home. We were so happy. At least we were in the beginning, but then Alex came and wanted to ask me something. Hey honey, I have a big favor to ask you. What do you want to ask? Do you think it would be okay for my mom to come for a visit? I would love for her to see the new house. I was hesitant to say yes, but I knew that it would make Alex happy, so I agreed. A few weeks later, she came over and I could tell that she was impressed with the house. This place is so lovely. I bet your family is jealous of how massive your home is. Um, yeah, it was a good thing that we saved the money I had from selling my house back home. Without it, we would have never been able to afford this. As if someone like you could actually have enough money to afford a place like this. I didn't know what to say. She hadn't even been in our home for an hour and she was already back to being mean. Part of me wanted to speak to Alex about what she said, but I didn't want to upset him. After all, he was so happy that he had his mother back and I didn't want to take that away from him. So I kept quiet, but it kept happening and she was getting worse. So why did you and Alex buy this house anyways? Well, the old place was too small and we're trying to have children, so we needed something with a bit more room. Children? I guess I can expect them to look like you, so I will be having black grandkids, ugh, and they'll probably have your ugly hair too. Excuse me? Why would you say such a horrible thing? Oh, don't be so sensitive. No one likes a woman that is offended by everything. I did my best to ignore her, but she was really pushing my buttons. It seemed like any time she drank that she would say terrible things. At first, my husband and I didn't mind her having a drink here and there, but she never had just one. And she only drank our wine and never bought any of her own. Our new home came with a wine cellar, and we took pride in putting different kinds of wines from around the world in it, and she was quickly emptying it. On top of that, she was a horrible chain smoker too. And even though we asked her to smoke outside on the patio, she would ignore us and smoke in her room and try to hide it by spraying air freshener. Of course, it didn't hide anything though, as we knew what she was doing, but again. Things between Alex and her were finally good, and neither of us wanted to rock the boat. That is, until I came home from the gym and found her passed out in the living room. She was drunk and had fallen asleep in a chair while watching TV. Next to her, I saw a burn mark on the chair and noticed that she had been smoking and when she fell asleep that her cigarette had burned a hole in it. That was the last straw for me. Wake up. Wake up right now, you idiot. I just couldn't take any more. I needed her to understand that this wouldn't be tolerated anymore. Huh? What are you shouting about? Don't you see that you ruined the chair? This can't keep happening. You're drinking all the wine and making the house stink like smoke. Unless you want us to kick you out. I suggest you stop being such a terrible house guest. You can't kick me out. I have nowhere to go. I have no money or home. Besides, what right do you have to speak to me like this? I wish my son had married someone white. I was so angry, but then she fell back asleep. That was the last straw, and so I called my husband who was out running errands. I'm sorry, Alex, but we need to do something about your mother. I just came home and found her passed out in the living room. She dropped her cigarette and burned a hole in the chair. She did what? Yes, and on top of that, she's back to her old ways. She keeps saying racist things to me. I've had enough of her. I'm so sorry, honey. I had no idea, but you're right. She has overstayed her welcome, and it's time for her to leave. I think it's time we cut ties with her again. According to her, she has no money or home to go back to. What? But does that mean that she had intended to live with us forever? That was not what we had agreed. Okay, that's it. For sure, when I get home, 
We are going to kick her out. I was so angry that I could barely see straight, but I needed to go and wash up before getting started on dinner, and so I left her in the living room. As I stepped out of the shower, though, I smelled something odd. It almost smelled like the smoke that comes off a campfire. That's when I panicked and quickly ran to the living room to check on my mother-in-law. The smell of smoke was getting stronger as I got near, and when I walked into the room, it was like walking into an oven. Nearly every square inch of the room was engulfed in flames. Thankfully, my mother-in-law was nowhere to be seen. Terrified, I ran outside and called the fire department. Sadly though, by the time that they arrived, the house was destroyed. Nothing was left of the house except ash and dust. Our dream home was gone. When I finally was able to find my mother-in-law, I was beyond angry. You evil cow. I had just told you not to smoke in the house because you ruined the furniture, and now you've gone and done something worse. You burned down our house. Oh, it's okay. My son will buy another and hopefully he'll divorce you. I bet that the fire was all your fault anyways. How could it be? It was from your smoking that the house burned down. That's it. I'll put you in your place. She swung her fist at me and punched me square in the jaw. Unfortunately for her, not only did the firefighters witness it, but my husband, who had just come home, saw it too. Everyone rushed over to pull her off me. That's it, mother. I was stupid to think that you had changed. But not only are you cruel to my wife, but now you've gone and destroyed our home too. I never want to see you again. She sobered up quickly when she heard that and then stormed off. Alex and I weren't going to let it go at that though, and we called the police. And when they arrived, they took statements from everyone that was present. While the police were listening to our story, the firefighters came over and confirmed that the fire had been caused by a lit cigarette in the living room, which confirmed that my mother-in-law was at fault. After hearing that the police went out to find her, and when they did, they arrested her. Not only was she charged for assaulting me, but they also charged her with negligence that led to the destruction of property. The judge that sentenced her was going to be lenient, but before he chose how much time in jail to give her, he asked if anyone had anything to say in defense of her. We instead told stories about who she truly is, and upon hearing them, the judge gave her the maximum penalty. As of today, she is still in jail, and I have no doubt that she might just be there for the rest of her life. And if you ask me, I think she got off easy. Alex and I, however, have never been happier. We received insurance money from the destruction of our house and were able to rebuild it and improve on the old design. And we finished rebuilding it just in time as well. Since we had been expecting a baby and we had the pleasure of stepping into our new home with our newborn daughter. Thanks for watching. Hi there, my name is Claire and I know that I look well put together, but I wasn't always this way. In fact, growing up, my family was very poor. My mother and father did their best and there was always food on the table, but we never bought anything that wasn't from a secondhand store. It was just the four of us. My mother and father, and then there was myself and my sister Mary. We did have extended family, but we never met them. When I was old enough, my mother told me that the reason that this was the case was due to the fact that she was black and that my father was white. I didn't really understand it, but since we didn't see them, it really wasn't a problem. After all, our parents were different, and my sister and I were different as well. She looked like our father and had very pale skin, while mine was more like our mother's and very dark. So for us, it always just seemed normal. That is, until that fateful night. My parents had gone to a party at a friend's house, and on their way home, they got into a car accident. They were rushed to a hospital, but unfortunately passed away soon after. At the time, my sister was 13 and I was 11. My sister and I were terrified. We didn't know what would become of us. Since we didn't have any family present to claim us, we were sent to a foster home. I still remember crying my eyes out and not understanding what was going on. We were there for a week when we were told that they had good news for us and that they had tracked down our grandparents. Both my sister and I were shocked to hear this. We weren't sure how to feel, really. Part of us were excited to meet them, but we were worried as they were complete strangers. When they arrived, we saw that they looked exactly like our father. Their faces were so warm and inviting. 
They greeted Mary affectionately and kissed her on her head dozens of times. However, when their eyes fell on me, their smiles faded and they didn't even come over and hug me even though I wanted them to more than anything. After a few hours, they left and my sister and I were wondering what to make of the visit. But the next day, our grandparents sent a car. We assumed that it was there to collect both of us, but the looks on the faces of our foster parents said otherwise. Neither of them were very happy. Girls, your grandparents sent a car to pick you up. But we have some bad news. Bad news? We don't understand. Well, the car is only here to pick up Mary. I'm very sorry, Claire. But they only filled out paperwork to adopt Mary. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. As if losing our parents wasn't bad enough. Now my sister and I were going to be separated as well? That night, I cried myself to sleep. I had never been alone before, and I didn't know how to handle it. I was devastated, and I couldn't help but feel that I was worthless and garbage. The years that followed were hard. I was bounced around from foster home to foster home. Some were better than others, but none ever felt truly like home. Nothing ever felt as happy and secure as how I felt with my parents and sister growing up. I did keep in contact with my sister through email, though. The messages that we sent to one another were a beacon of hope in a very dark time in my life. She told me stories about how our grandparents were spoiling her, giving her everything that she could ever want. She had more clothes than she could ever wear. She always had the best computer and went to a private school and ate all the best foods. I couldn't help but feel jealous. My grandparents were exceptionally wealthy and spent their money freely on my sister. While I lived in poverty since my foster parents never really cared for me that much, more than once, I tried to send letters or emails to my grandparents begging them to adopt me as well. I tried my best to make them understand that I would be happier living with them and that I would be a picture-perfect addition to their family, that it was so unfair that they had separated my sister and I, but they never responded. My sister tried to beg them to adopt me as well, but they would get angry to the point where they were almost violent when she did, and so she stopped mentioning it. I knew that it weighed on her, but I also knew that it wasn't her fault. After I graduated from high school, I tried once more to reach out to them. I wasn't sure if I could get any scholarships and I was desperate to still be able to go to college. They had more than enough money to help me pay for school, but I also knew that it was a long shot. The day after I sent the email, they finally responded to me. Hello, Claire. Congratulations on being accepted to college. We understand that you are indeed our grandchild, However, that alone does not mean that we are obligated to help you. You are a reminder of our son's poor decision to marry someone inferior to our standing. Please don't ever write to us again. To us, you are nothing but a bad memory. Her words hurt badly, and I spent many nights crying, thinking that I would never be good enough for them. Thankfully, though, I did receive a letter saying that I had been awarded a full scholarship from a prestigious law firm. With my school completely paid for, I focused hard on my studies and years later graduated at the top of my class. I was even offered an entry-level position at the very law firm that had given me the scholarship. It turned out that the lead partners had all come from similar circumstances as myself. For the first time in a long time, I felt a part of a family, a part of a group of people that not only understood the pain that I had gone through, but also accepted me despite of it. As the years drew on, I rose up in the firm and even met my husband there. The two of us eventually became partners in the firm, and we now live in a mansion with three beautiful children of our own. My sister, however, chose a different path, and while I am proud of the woman that she has become, she chose to follow her passions, and she became a teacher. I know that it makes her very happy, and I even assisted her in finding a home that she could afford since I make quite a bit more than her. Things were finally going well for me, but then I got an email from my grandparents. Apparently, they had made some poor investments, and they were going to be forced to sell their home to pay for their debts. They had squandered their fortune and were desperate. Hello, Claire. We are very sorry for how we have treated you in the past. We have come to see that we blamed you for something that wasn't even your fault. Please, could you find it in your heart to forgive us for our poor choices? We would love to get to know you and your husband and our great-grandchildren as well. Please forgive us. I instantly knew why they had written the letter. They had no other options and had only reached out to me because they were screwed otherwise. My sister couldn't afford to have them stay with her. After all, although her home was quite lovely, there was no room for them and my sister didn't make enough money to help them get a new home of their own. On top of that, 
the closer that my sister and I became, the more distant she became with our grandparents. Neither of us could forgive them for separating us all those years ago. And so, just as they had done to me, I wrote them back. Hello, I am very sorry to hear of your plight and that you are having such a hard time right now. However, I cannot help but feel that it is all well-deserved. I can't tell you how many nights I fell asleep crying because you left me alone in foster care while you gave my sister everything in the world, and all because of the color of my skin. So no, I won't be helping you, and I would greatly appreciate that you never write to me again. They of course ignored the last part and kept sending emails begging me to reconsider, but I had no interest in entertaining them. Later I found out that they had been forced to move into a retirement home and that the only one that they could afford was terrible. The staff were mean to the residents and they were fed the blandest and poorest foods. My sister would visit them on the holidays, but only for very brief visits, and they constantly pleaded with her to speak to me and get me to take them in, but I only ever laughed these requests away. After all, they had abandoned me and I had been forced to do everything the hard way. I had worked hard to get an education and then a fantastic job. Then I found someone that truly loved me for who I am and we have made a wonderful family. We both know what it's like to not have anything and so we make a point to tell our children every day that they are loved and treasured. As far as I'm concerned, my grandparents are exactly where they deserve to be. Thanks for watching. Hello, my name is Thomas and I have a bit of a cautionary tale for you. You see it all started when my wife Amy and I decided that we were ready to have children. It took a while, but when my wife told me that she was pregnant, we were both overjoyed and couldn't wait to meet our new child. At the time, we were living with my in-laws and things were going quite well. We got along perfectly. That is, until my boss told me that he needed me to transfer from our office to the main corporate office on the other side of the country. I would have preferred to stay with my in-laws, but the transfer did come with a large raise and we would need the extra money to help with our baby, so I accepted. Luckily for us, my father and his new wife lived in the city that we were moving to, and while it wouldn't be as nice as my in-law's house, we planned for it to only be temporary until we found something of our own. My father and I got along great, and he was happy that we would be moving in. My stepmother, though, was someone who I hadn't always seen eye to eye with. You see, my mother passed away many years ago, and for a long time, my father stayed single. But a couple years ago, he met Sonia, who was only a couple years older than myself, and the two of them got married. It was awkward considering how young she was. When we arrived, though, she was polite and happy that we were moving in with them. She especially made a fuss over my wife and made sure she was always comfortable. When I mentioned to them that we would only stay with them long enough until we found our own place, Sonia wouldn't hear any of it. That's silly. You two should stay here with us. After all, we have lots of room and you'll need help taking care of the new baby. While you're at work, we'll be here to watch them for you. I had to be honest. The idea of having a free babysitter was tempting. After all, daycare was very expensive and it would be convenient for us. After a short discussion, my wife and I decided that it was a great idea. We should have realized that something was up though when Sonia began buying lots of baby clothes and a brand new crib. My father tried to say that she was just trying to help us out and that it was just her way of making us feel welcome. Neither my wife or I saw the signs of what this foretold. A few months later, my son Ricky was born and all of us were beyond happy. He was healthy and we all fell in love with him immediately. But soon after is when we began to have issues. My wife was exhausted and worn out from the delivery, so when Sonia began watching over Ricky while my wife rested, it felt like a blessing. But after a while, it began to be a bit too much. As soon as my wife finished feeding Ricky, Sonia would insist on her taking a nap or resting, which gave Sonia alone time with Ricky. Amy noticed that this was happening more and more often. She was grateful for the help, but she began to question why Sonia was denying her time with her own son. And so my wife came to me and was in distress. You need to have a word with Sonia. Why? What's wrong? She is taking Ricky far too much. As soon as I'm finished feeding him, she takes him away and walks around with him. I barely get a chance to ever hold my own child. And if that wasn't enough, whenever she takes him, she never dresses him correctly. She'll take him outside and won't put a jacket or hat on him. And she lets him sleep in dirty clothes rather than cleaning him up before bed. I knew that Sonia was spending a lot of time with Ricky, 
but I had no idea just how much time she was taking away from Amy. To be honest, I was a bit jealous as I had barely gotten to spend any time with Ricky, but I figured that it was more important for him to spend time with Amy. Meanwhile, I didn't know that not only was I not spending time with him, but that Amy wasn't either. The clothes comment. I had observed it too. And so I went to talk to Sonia and try to figure out what was going on. Hey Sonia, can we talk? Um, sure, what about? We are very grateful for all your help, but both Amy and I feel that we aren't spending enough time with Ricky. I know that you love him, but I think that it's in his best interest to spend less time with you and more time with us, his parents. What's that supposed to mean? It's just that Amy is beginning to feel like she barely sees her own son, other than when it's time to feed him. No, I love him just as much as you two and I have a right to spend time with him. Did you maybe consider that the reason I want to spend time with him is because I can't have children of my own? I had no idea that was the case. And while I had sympathy for her situation, it didn't change the fact that Ricky was our son and that it was important for him to spend as much time with his parents as possible. I didn't know that and I do sympathize. But Ricky is our son and we need to form a bond with him. You will always be in his life as well, but right now. It's very important for us to spend as much time together as possible. But you haven't done anything for him. I've bought all his clothes, his bed, even all his toys, his stroller, everything. What have you done? And we appreciate all of that. But he is our son. Just because you bought him stuff, that doesn't give you more of a right to spending time with him. He is a part of Amy and I and represents our love for one another. The next day, I got a call from my wife that Sonia had taken Ricky to watch him while my wife had a nap and when she woke up, that both Sonia and Ricky were gone. I quickly called my father and we began trying to call Sonia to find out where she had gone, but all our calls went to her voicemail. We tried for hours and hours until she finally messaged back. What's going on? Why are you calling me so much? Because we don't know where you or Ricky are. Just pick up so we can talk. Oh, shut up already. I'm fine and Ricky is fine as well. I know what I'm doing. Just tell us where you are. Ricky will need to eat soon and we're all very upset and worried. I could tell that she was beginning to see reason and she finally told us that she had rented a hotel room nearby. Quickly, we all headed over there. I'm not sure what the problem is. It's not like I kidnapped him. You're just overreacting. Are you serious? That's exactly what you did. We trusted you and you betrayed our trust. You don't understand though. Ricky needs a loving mother, and I know that I can be a better mother than you. It's not fair that you get to have such a loving son and I can't. That's enough. We talked about this. If you want to have a child that badly, we can always adopt. But for you to deny my son and his wife time with their own child is wrong. I've been telling you to keep your distance. And instead, you forced yourself into between them and their firstborn child. But I was only just trying to help. Yes, and at first you did. But you took things too far. Amy is right. You broke our trust. I think it would be best for us to move out. No, but Ricky needs me. Please don't go. No, he needs his mother. How were you going to feed him even? I would have figured something out. I bought milk and juice from the store that I could give him. You can't be serious. That's not good for him. Both my wife and I were fed up. We had no idea that my stepmother was capable of doing such an erratic thing. And what made it worse was that she didn't realize that what she had done was wrong. She merely thought we were overreacting. We grabbed Ricky and quickly left, vowing to never speak to Sonia again. Soon after, we began looking for a place to stay and found a house to rent and moved out. It was, of course, a huge adjustment as we had less help around the house. But we knew that it was the right choice for us and for Ricky as well. After that day, Sonia began calling us nonstop, but we ignored her calls. My father even tried to get her to go and speak with a therapist, but she refused as she claimed that there was nothing wrong with her. In the end, he filed for divorce as she was no longer the same person anymore, and he couldn't forgive her for putting his only grandson in danger. Since then, my father comes over to our new place once a week to visit, and as for Sonia, well, she still tries to contact us from time to time. But we are grateful that she doesn't know where we live. Thankfully, Ricky was too young and he won't remember any of this, but we will never again trust Sonia.
Hi, my name is Claire, and my parents were wonderful people when I was young. They always doted on me and gave me all the attention I could ever desire. But all of that changed when my little brother Josh was born. My parents always wanted a son. So when Josh was born, suddenly they no longer cared about me and just focused all their attention on him. When we went to school and brought home our report cards, they would treat us completely differently. My brother would receive C's and they would tell him that he was doing well. It's okay, Josh. We know that you did your best and that no matter what these silly grades say, we know that you are the smartest in your grade, possibly in your school. Yes, son, we know that you did your best. Keep up the good work. But for me, it was always different. Nothing I ever did was good enough for them. What is this nonsense? You only got B's? You're such a disgrace to this family. Why couldn't you get A's? Why are you such an idiot? It's a good thing that we had Josh. You are such a disappointment. They were always so incredibly cruel to me. As soon as I could get a job, they forced me to do so. When I turned 13, they stopped providing the most basic supplies, such as soap, shampoo, or even toothpaste. Instead, they forced me to work and spend the little money that I made to pay for everything which meant I could never save up money. It was so hard trying to find time for both school and for work, but I managed. Of course, Josh never had to work. My parents always provided for him and gave him whatever he wanted. If a new video game console came out, he would get it, and I was never allowed to even look at it. When it came to playing sports or after-school activities, they never had a problem paying for anything when it came to Josh. But they wouldn't even give me $5 for lunch money. I knew that it wasn't normal for them to treat me like this. But what was I supposed to do? It wasn't like I could just leave. While I did have a job, I couldn't afford to live on my own. All that changed, though, when I turned 18. I came home from work and my parents were waiting for me. For a brief second, I thought that they were going to wish me a happy birthday. But then I noticed that they had packed some suitcases and had them waiting by the front door. Why are my things all packed up? What's going on? You're 18 now, and it's time for you to move out and get your own place. Your mother is right. We need the extra space for your brother. He isn't a loser like you. He has potential and will go places. Yeah, I need to use it as a recording studio for my streaming channel. Before I could say anything, they pushed me out of the house and then threw my suitcases on top of me. Shocked, I tried to open the door, but it was locked, and they started to scream that I needed to leave. If you don't leave right away, we'll call the police and have you arrested. I didn't know what to do. On the one hand, I had wanted to move out as soon as I could, but I was nowhere near ready. There was barely any money in my bank account as my parents forced me to spend my own money for everything. In a daze, I picked up my suitcases and started walking down the street. I honestly didn't know where I was going when it started to rain. Looking around, the only place that I saw that was open was a cafe, so I quickly ran into it and sat down. Suddenly, I started crying and I couldn't stop myself. All the years of abuse and now to be kicked out and forced to live on the street. All that pain just came rushing up and flowing out of my eyes like a waterfall. I almost didn't even notice as the owner of the cafe came over and sat across from me until she slid a hot cup of tea over to me. Hello there. I can see that you're having a very hard day. Here, drink this. It won't make the day any less terrible, but it tastes delicious and will help to warm you up. Um, thank you. I really appreciate it, but I, um, I... I can't afford it. Oh? Well, then it's a good thing that it's free. My treat. Just one of the perks of owning a cafe like this. I was so grateful and so cold that I quickly reached for the cup of tea and began to drink it as fast as I could. Once I was done, the owner told me that her name was Maria and that she had inherited the cafe and the hotel that it was attached to from her parents. She had always wanted to leave it to her own children, but her husband had passed away years ago before they could have children. After she had been so open with me and shared her story, I told her my own and she was floored after hearing it. That's terrible. Your parents sound like awful people. Well, I'll tell you what, I have a room on the very top floor that's empty. If you like, you can come and work for me and I'll pay you and you can stay in that room. What do you say? Of course I said yes. I was desperate and she was offering me a lifeline. She then led me upstairs to my room and it was massive. It was a full apartment up there, complete with a kitchen, a large bedroom, and a bathroom as well. It turned out that she lived in the room across the hall. 
She told me to go and get cleaned up and rest for the night, and in the morning that she would show me the ropes of running a hotel and cafe. Surprisingly, I took to it very easily, and the customers were lovely. I began to develop friendships with the regulars, and even began to look forward to their arrivals. And Maria was such a pleasure to work with, and we began to develop a very strong friendship until one day she approached me with a request. I know that you're an adult, and this might sound odd, but would you mind if I adopted you? You're just such a wonderful young woman, and I would be honored to be your mother. Nothing would make me happier. Yes, I think I would love that. Thank you, Maria. I mean, thank you, Mom. And with that, we hugged. It had been a long time since I had known what the love of a parent felt like, and I cherished it. And so we worked diligently as a team, and for years, we worked hard to make the hotel and cafe blossom, and slowly we had to hire more staff as our clientele grew. We were doing so well, in fact, that the local news station came and did a story about us and how successful our business was. A few months later, though, my brother and father came into the cafe. I almost didn't recognize them, though, as they were dressed in rags and their faces looked incredibly dirty. As soon as they saw me, they ran over and got down on their knees. Oh, Claire, please, please forgive us. We were wrong to have kicked you out. Yes, please, Claire. Can we please have some food and move in with you? And money. Please, we really need money as well. You two have a lot of nerve coming in and asking me that. I knew instantly that they had to be desperate after all. They would never beg me of all people for money or do so even remotely politely. And so I began to ask them what had happened. It turned out that a month after they had forced me out, that my mother had become ill and passed away. Sadly, the one thing that could save her life was a bone marrow transplant, and there was a good chance that I was a match, but they didn't know what had become of me. After my mother passed away, my father began drinking heavily, and he ended up losing his job, and without his salary, they could no longer afford their house anymore. My brother kept trying to be a successful streamer, and he used a lot of my parents' money to buy equipment and gear. But no matter how much money he spent, he just couldn't develop an audience. Everyone thought he was a snob and entitled and refused to watch. As a result, they ended up living on the street when they saw me on the news and figured that I would just let them back in my life. Of course, I told them that I wanted nothing to do with them and that they needed to leave right away. Reluctantly, they did, but that night they came back when everyone was asleep and in their beds and they tried to rob us. They figured that if I wasn't going to help them willingly, then they would just take what they wanted. Thankfully, we had an alarm system and the police were called and arrested them when they arrived. The judge assigned to their case wasn't very lenient on them and the two of them ended up going to jail for many years. Deep down, I did feel a little guilty, but it passed quickly. After all, they had never shown me any love and had treated me terribly. It's kind of funny though. I sort of ended up getting revenge without really having to do anything. Their misfortune all came about because they kicked me out of the house. If they hadn't, then my mother would still be alive. And if she were still alive, then my father would still have his job. And if he still had his job, then maybe my brother might have been able to become famous if he had stuck to his streaming channel long enough. Instead, they ended up dead or in a jail cell. While I had finally found a true loving mother and a place where I truly felt at home and loved, thanks for watching. Hi, my name is Cleo, and I have two children with my husband. My son is eight years old, and my daughter is six and a half. They're great kids. They're thoughtful, kind, and hardworking, just as I brought them up to be. Timothy is a budding football player, and Sophia is learning her way around a chessboard faster than I ever thought possible. They never caused any real trouble, and though they fought sometimes, as children will always do, I never had too much trouble with them which is why what my mother-in-law and husband did to them shocked me to my core. I run an online self-help website that gained popularity suddenly. I was invited to Berlin to give a speech, and because my husband couldn't take the time off of work, we had to invite his mother to stay at the house and watch over the children. I was to be away for a week, and I promised to call them every night. 
The first night I called, nothing seemed amiss. They looked a little tired, but before I scolded them, I remembered what my own grandmother was like. All play and no sleep, sweets for dinner and late night movies. I thought that they were going to be having a great time bonding with their grandma. They certainly didn't complain about anything, so I thought nothing of it. Are you guys having a good time? Yes, Mom. What are you getting up to? We've been in the garden today, and tomorrow too because of the snow. Snow. Oh, that's exciting. Make a snowman to welcome Mommy home. Yes, Mom. The next day, I saw in the news that the snow back home had fallen much heavier than expected. School was closed, and most companies asked their employees to work from home. I called home straight away and saw my husband lounging in the kitchen with a cup of coffee. Did your work cancel? Yeah. They said that the snow affected their systems, and if we can't access the servers, we can't work. I'm not complaining. And the kids? Are their schools closed? Yeah. Well, I might as well talk with them if they're around. Call them in. They're in the garden right now. Oh, playing in the snow. Don't let them stay out too long. They'll catch their death out there. Don't be stupid, Cleo. They're children, not kittens. They're hardier than that. I was so surprised by his sudden anger that I simply accepted it and moved on. But I couldn't stop thinking about it all through the day. I was busy too and needed to be on the top of my game, but I had the most uncomfortable feeling in my gut. I knew that something was off. I just didn't know what. I called later that night and I saw my children again. Hi guys, how are you doing? Did you have fun in the snow? Immediately, Sophia starts to cry and Timothy looks close to following suit. Oh no, guys. What's wrong? Did someone knock down your snowman? We weren't allowed to play in the snow. But your dad said you were outside earlier. What were you doing? Grandma made us shovel all the snow out. Our hands are all covered in blisters. We're tired, Mommy. Please come home. My heart broken. My children were hurting and scared. Put Daddy on the phone. I could not express just how angry I was that my poor children had been forced to work during such severe weather conditions. More so that my husbands hadn't thought to step in and explain that we don't expect our children to do dangerous jobs. Hey, babe. Don't you hey, babies me. Do you know what our children just told me? Where have you been all day that your mother could have them out working their hands to blisters in the snow? I didn't realize they were being so whiny. Whiny? They were hurt. You should have stopped her. Why? It helps build character. They're children. They don't need to build character like that. They need to be cared for and talked to. You're coddling them. They're not babies anymore. They have to earn their keep. Are you crazy? In the olden days, children their age would have become apprentices. They will work hard, and they were happy for the opportunity. We're not in the olden days. We're in the modern age where we don't die at 30 and children have the opportunity to properly grow. Don't you dare make those kids work another second. I'm coming home. The absolute gall of the man to think he can hurt my babies like that. By the time I got home, I had riled myself up into a rage. And to make matters worse, I found my two darlings in the kitchen, scrubbing the floor, dark circles around their eyes and trembling. Mommy. My children ran into my arms, knocking over a bucket of water on their way. You filthy creatures, how dare you? Oh, Cleo, darling, welcome back. Timothy, Sophia, go upstairs, okay? Take a nap. You'll make them lazy if you keep treating them like that. I don't care much for your parents' style, and you can be sure that I'll never be inviting you back to be around my children. It was like talking to a wall because she had no change in expression. I thought that maybe she had lost her mind or something. I'm afraid that's not acceptable, Cleo. I didn't ask for your opinion. I gave you a fact, though. Get out of my house. What is going on here? Thank goodness, son, your wife has completely gone crazy. She's screaming and shouting and telling me how to raise children, as if she knows more than I do. Honestly, you need to put her in her place. Cleo, please talk to my mother with more respect. She has much more experience than you, and you should be pleased that she'd offer her motherly skills to our children. I will not be pleased that she forced our children to do jobs that even adults find difficult. And I can't believe you'd go along with it, especially after I told you my opinion. Don't talk to me like that in my own house. How dare you? How dare I? How dare you insinuate that either of us has more power in this household than the other? 
You people these days, you have no respect, no understanding of how the world works. Men are the heads of the house, and if my son says your children are old enough to go out and work, then you should listen to him. That is your role, and a dutiful wife. Dutiful wife? Is that what you've reduced me to? I was waiting for my husband to tell me no, to promise that he holds me in a much higher regard, but it quickly became apparent that wasn't the case. You are an idiot. Don't talk to me like that. I am your husband. Not for much longer. You don't get to make that decision. See, that's where you're wrong. I am the exact person to be making that decision because I am the person who brings in the most money. You promised that you'd never use that against me. And you promised that everyone in this house was equal. You broke your promise first. You're so flaky. No sense of commitment. In my day... Newsflash, your day is over. We're in my day now, and in my day, I care about the well-being of my children far more than I care about your opinion. What you had them doing borders on abuse, and if you want to avoid prison time, I suggest you get out of my house right now. They looked at each other as if checking to see who was going to fight back, but I think my husband realized first what was happening. I'll fight you in court. And you will lose. Goodbye. We did indeed end up in court, and as I predicted, the case went in my favor. I walked away with full custody, the house, and 70% of our life savings. My husband moved back in with his domineering mother and was made to do work around the house and his regular job on top of that, all the while being reminded of his failings when his mother berates him for being such a layabout that he has to live with his mother. He sometimes visits to see his children and often looks tired and miserable. Thanks for watching. Please like the video so it can be recommended to others to watch.